Today we're going to be talking about melodrama in Chinese, Tong Su Ju or San Qing Ju, Ju. So from the name, you can tell that melodrama is about heightened emotions, uh, creating strong, suspenseful emotions for the audience. And usually it does this by arranging a complicated plot that moves very fast and where different things all come to a head at the same climax. Now, this can describe many kinds of films that we watch today, but today we don't really make films that are called melodramas. And the reason is because melodramas are no longer considered artistic enough. In the past, films were only seen as popular entertainment. So people only cared about how the audience reacted uh, to the film and whether they are engrossed in what's happening, whether they care about the film or not. But today, film can also be a kind of art form. And so when we think about all the different things that a film can do, only focusing on plot and suspense no longer seems artistic enough. So today, the genre of melodrama has died, but the elements that make up that genre still exist in many different other genres of film. So for example, many thrillers, Jing Song Pian, can be technically considered melodramas. Depending on how organically, how convincingly, the film builds its suspense. If it is kind of rough and awkward, we might say that it's melodramatic. So the word melodrama isn't used very much anymore, but the adjective melodramatic is still frequently used as a negative description. When something seems for when a story seems to happen only to create that heightened suspenseful emotion people often call it melodramatic it's a, as a negative term to to mean that it's not artistic enough it's not detailed enough it's not a complete work it, so the word melodramatic can mean things like emotionally manipulative unconvincing, uh, sometimes even absurd. So for example, a few years ago, there was a movie called Searching starring John Cho, and the movie takes place entirely on digital screens. Uh, so we only get the computer screen or the phone screen that John Cho's character is looking at, uh, or the television screen, the uh, security camera screen. And the story is that one day, John Cho, who is a single father, wakes up and discovers that his teenage daughter is missing. So he goes to search for his teenage daughter. And near the end of the film, there is a twist. You're probably not going to see this movie, right? So I'm just going to spoil it for you. Near the end of the movie, there's a twist. They catch the bad guy and they realize that uh, the daughter has been thrown off a cliff and has been lying there for like a week. And so she's probably dead. But then someone suddenly, uh, and at this moment, they are taking the bad guy to the police station. They are on the road. And we, we are looking at this scene through a TV screen where the new the local news helicopter is shooting the footage of the cars on the road. So uh, they're on the road and they think that the daughter is probably dead. And then suddenly we see the cars stop and they turn around and go back. And then the movie says. But it rained two days ago. Which means that the daughter may still be alive. Now. Like, if you think about it logically, then yes, it's possible, but it's not very likely that they would remember it. This uh, the idea that it rained 
at this exact moment. And that they would literally we would literally see them turning the car around. It's one of those twists that. Uh, hinders our suspension of disbelief when it happens. We don't believe the film. It feels fake. So that is something that would be called melodramatic today. Uh, but as I just said, it's not illogical. It's only implausible. And if you think about it, so much crazy stuff happens in life. People often say the truth is stranger than fiction. In a story, when something crazy happens, the audience might think that that's not going to happen. But in real life, so many crazy things happen that if you put it into a story, it wouldn't make sense. So recently there have been people saying that. Yes, melodramas feel fake. They feel like it wouldn't really happen that way. But if you look at the life that we actually have, so many things are actually melodramatic. Like think of all the times in your life that important things have happened one after the other. Maybe they're good things, maybe they're bad things. Uh, but the structure of life usually does not follow the structure of a story. And so from this point of view, melodramas. Can also be a reflection of life. Even if the events, the crazy events are not likely, the emotions of the characters can be relatable. What is something important in life? What is an important event? This is different for each person. So if we, the audience, we look at an event and we feel like mm, it's not worth the high emotions that the film gives it. That's not a knock against the event. That's not because the event itself is not important. It's because the film has not done good character work. It has not brought us into the world of the character so that we understand why this event is important for the character. So it's not a problem with melodrama. It's just a problem with basic filmmaking. It's a problem that can happen in any genre. But this is just an academic discussion. The genre has died. It's probably not coming back soon. Um, but it's worth remembering the idea that there are moments of strong emotion in life when we watch a film that at first might seem melodramatic. Today we're going to be watching a, a melodrama. One of I think it's one of the last actual melodrama films made. So it's worth exploring how a melodrama works. How does it create that moment of high emotion? How does it make things happen quickly? For one, it's not just one plot line. It's multiple things happening at the same time. If you think about a soap opera on TV, how do they get those moments of confrontation? They arrange multiple stories that, that develop at the same time, and all of these stories end up in the same scene to conclude. It's like um, when you're building a puzzle, when you're doing a puzzle and you start from the corners, and then you go to the edges and then slowly you fill in the middle. It's like when you finally get two or three edges to meet somewhere in the middle and all of a sudden the picture comes to life and everything connects. That sense of excitement can be used in a melodrama. So like character A has a story, character B has a story. It's related. But the characters don't know until the end of the film and suddenly they meet and they realize everything is connected. But we with the audience, we know that they are connected. So every time they may be about to find out the truth, maybe they're almost going to meet each other. We the audience feel suspense. We feel excited. Uh, another way that 
um, melodrama works to build speed and tension is by giving the characters many obstacles. Uh, in any film, a character trying to do something will meet obstacles and challenges, but usually those challenges come from the situation itself. For example, if a character wants to try to become famous, then we there are expected obstacles, right? Maybe the parents uh, disapprove. Maybe they have a hard time uh, finding someone to take them seriously. Uh, but in a melodrama, we don't just have these organic obstacles. We also have obstacles that, as as we say in English, come out of left field, come out of the blue sky. They're unexpected. So like if the story is about someone trying to become famous, maybe one obstacle will be just as their big movie is finally going to come out, the COVID-19 pandemic hits and everything shuts down and nobody sees their movie. In a regular story, nobody would expect this kind of twist. Um, but this example also tells us how life can also be very melodramatic because that is exactly what happened to many movies. Uh, COVID-19 hit, theaters closed down, uh, and many people who might have gone to see a new movie suddenly did not see it. And that, of course, has a big effect on the filmmakers and the box office income. So rule the woman, Kelfang so rule. Uh, or another example might be like this person trying to become famous. Just as they're almost going to succeed, suddenly they get kidnapped. Again, entirely unexpected. But at the same time, nobody expects to be kidnapped. When someone kidnaps you, it's always a surprise. So again, unlikely, unexpected, but possible in life as well. Uh, so a related discussion would be like, uh, did you guys see the Aquaman movie? In that movie, one of the things that critics really did not like about that movie is basically every scene ends with a surprise explosion. That's how the plot moves forward not like from A to B to C, but like they're talking about something and suddenly boom and a bad guy comes or like they're going somewhere and boom, like something bad happens and there's an explosion. And critics thought that this was incredibly unconvincing. But I happen to think that if you're Aquaman and you're like going on a quest, an adventure to look for something and you go to many dangerous places and you have enemies, I think it's quite likely that your enemies will take you by surprise or that the environment will suddenly start exploding and collapsing because you're surrounded by danger. So again, the idea of melodrama, what is melodramatic, depends on how convincing the film can make it, not on the event itself. So like we've been discussing many things that a melodrama can do to create suspense and tension and high emotion. Some of you may have realized that a lot of these strategies are also used in romantic comedies. Uh, usually the romantic comedies that use these strategies will therefore be called melodramatic and will be seen as like less artistic, not as good a film. For example, the movie Serendipity starring John Cusack and Kate Beckinsale is about a guy and a girl who meet and fall in love, but the girl says that she wants to make sure that he is the right guy, so she lets fate decide. And she does this by leaving him no contact information uh, and seeing whether they will rediscover and re-encounter each other again. 
kind of stupid, right? Um, but throughout the movie, they keep on almost seeing each other. Like one person gets on an elevator just at the same time as the other person gets off the elevator across the hall. Or like one person leaves the room and then the second person enters the room. That kind of shit. Um, and it's, of course, entirely unconvincing. But again, think about how many people live in the same city as you or in the same country as you. Think about how small your social circle is, your social circle, and like how small the, lo the number of locations that your social circle might go to. It's not impossible that you might have near encounters all the time and never know. In fact, uh, the pandemic has shown us this as well. When the government releases the footprints of um, confirmed cases, like think about how many times you may have thought to yourself, Oh, I was in that place just a few hours later, or uh, I almost decided to go there, but but later on decided to stay home. Right, all of these near encounters. So it seems unlikely, but again, melodrama just so happens to reveal another side of life that maybe we don't pay a lot of attention to. So when we watch a melodrama or when we watch a melodramatic film and something incredibly unlikely happens and we think bullshit that would never happen i think that's a good chance to re-examine our assumptions why do we think that would never happen is it possible that we are believing in a structure of the world that is not in fact, how the world is structured? Could it be that we're missing a part of life? Just some things to think about. OK, so that is melodrama. Do you have questions? Okay, the second half of today's lecture is about silent films. Pian. And this is mainly because the silent era was a great era of melodrama. There are a few reasons why, but first let me uh, introduce silent films. Silent films are not actually silent. You uh, in the old days, there would not be sound that comes with the film, but in the theaters, they would have a band or an orchestra that would play live music while you watch the movie. So there's a score, you'll pay it. It's just like, like different for each theater and different each time you watch uh, because it doesn't come with the image. So think about all of the uses of sound that we have talked about in film. The score in the past was live music. Sound effects. In the past, you had to imagine them for yourself. And of course, one of the most important parts is dialogue, people talking. How do you tell a story where nobody talks? It's possible. But for most popular stories, you have to have some people talking. So how did they deal with this in silent films? Two ways. First, if the situation is clear and you know basically what the character is saying, they just skip the actual details. So like, for example, if you have a shot of a man opening a door for a woman and the woman turns to the man and moves her mouth and says something, She's and then she walks in. She's obviously saying something like, thank you, you're so kind, how kind of you. So the film doesn't bother to tell us what she says. It's very predictable. 
And if, in fact, this does reflect what happens in daily life. In much of our conversations in daily life, when we're being polite or we're saying something that people expect us to say, it's not surprising. We all know what we're saying, basically. Even if the specific words are different each time, the meaning is similar in those specific situations. So like it doesn't really matter the specific words as long as you understand what the person is saying. But then you have situations that are unique to the story. They are exposition, giving you background information, giving you important plot information. So how do silent films deal with this? They add what are called intercards or intertitles or title cards. So not intercards, intertitles or title cards. And these are. So for example, if two people are talking, you have a shot of one person moving their mouth, talking to the other person. Then in the middle of the shot, we get a black screen with words in white on the screen telling us exactly what the person says. This card will stay on the screen for like five seconds, then it will cut back to the scene and the first person will continue to talk until they're finished. So it's kind of like using editing to do dialogue. Soya. And uh, Sorry, what was I saying? So it's uh, it. We still do this today when we have subtitles. We don't wait for the characters to finish talking before we read the subtitles, right? They talk and we read at the same time. Uh, so the logic is still very similar. Now using intertitles gives you many more options than in sound movies where you have to listen to the person talk. With intertitles, you can convey much more information in the same title card. You can do use like fancy wordplay. Uh, so like when you listen to someone talk, it, it's the difference between listening to a speech and reading a book. When you listen to a speech, you can't decide the speed, right? You have to keep up with the person talking. And at the end of each sentence, you may have already forgotten the beginning of the sentence but you hopefully still remember the meaning of the sentence. But when you read a book, you can slow down, control the speed. You can pay attention to the details of the word choice, the word order, and the use of language. So these are things that using title cards allows audiences to do. They don't just focus on the meaning, they also can pay attention to how the language is used, how the language is designed. Uh, now, another thing to know about silent films is that in those days, the speed of film, uh, how do I say this? If you remember in the week on cinematography, we mentioned how to speed up the film or how to slow down the film. If you want to make the film go faster, you slow down the camera so that it takes fewer pictures. So when you put the pictures together, it moves faster. In the old days, cameras did not take uh, as many pictures. So the film was projected faster. So if you look at old silent films, it looks more like a cartoon because characters move faster, things move faster. 
It, it looks less realistic. Uh, and they did this to save money. Film, film stock, like is incredible was incredibly expensive. It still is expensive. Uh, and in the early days of cinema, they didn't have as much money to get everything right. So they cut costs by shooting by using less film. And therefore, when you play the film back, it moves faster. This helped make better melodramas. Remember, a melodrama depends on speed. So if your movie moves faster, then uh, it already creates more excitement and more tension. It also helps slapstick comedy. Because that is a kind of more cartoon kind of uh, movie uh, when people bump into things, hit each other and nothing bad happens. So like speeding things up gives it more speed, it makes it gives it more energy and makes things more exciting. So when something funny happens, you get a stronger reaction. Now, there are obvious limitations to silent films. Yes, we can read the exact dialogue, the use of language, but we can't hear the actors choosing how to deliver their lines. Unlike a play, a stage play. So when sound that goes with film was first invented, people were, uh, they reacted like people always do when something new happens. Some people want to explore the new possibilities. Other people are worried that the old ways of doing things would die out and that they would have to relearn everything. Both sides are, of course, correct. It's not entirely good, it's not entirely bad, it's a change. So back when films were mostly silent, silent films were just called films. And when sound films were first invented, they were called talkies. Because people can actually talk in those movies and we can hear them talk. The movie that really kicked off uh, the switch to sound is called The Jazz Singer. And as you can guess from the title, it's a movie about a jazz singer. And for the first time in cinema history, people who go to watch a movie can actually hear a musician sing while they see the musician sing. The movie itself is not very good. It's also kind of racist, uh, but it was very popular and it made a ton of money and it convinced filmmakers that maybe making talkies could be profitable, that maybe the possibilities are worth exploring, even if we start to lose some of the skills of making a silent film. Uh, from then on, uh, there were first added sound and mu uh, score and music, then dialogue, and then finally uh, we had sound effects. And at the beginning of the use of sound effects, it was already focused entirely on the character's subjective experience. So as we talked about in the week of sound, today sound effects strive for realism, convince you that this really is the sound that you can hear if you are in this place. But at the beginning, it was less realism and more subjectivity. What sounds do the characters care about? What sounds do they pay attention to? Um, and only as the art of Foley, Niing, Peying, matured, did we get a more realistic sound environment. Um, the, the fact that silent films were played back faster than films are today means that you can immediately tell if a film is old or new based on how fast things are 
moving on screen, how fast people move. And the difference is big enough that if a movie today wanted to try to speed things up, it's immediately noticeable. For example, if you've seen the Batman, the one starring Robert Pattinson and Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman. In Catwoman's fight scenes, she moves very fast because she's Catwoman, but she actually moves too fast. If it like the film speeds up her fight sequences to make them more exciting. And you can tell because. I'm sorry to say this, but the Batman is a very poorly made film, like the filmmaking quality is very low. Um, they not only speed up her fights. When she's doing things as Catwoman, like she's jumping around, sneaking into buildings, looking through people's things, all of those sequences are also sped up. Which doesn't make sense. If you're fighting, then fine. It's two people interacting with each other. Maybe they're both very fast fighters. I can I can accept that. But when you're looking through somebody's like things, when you're digging through somebody's bag, you not only get human movement, you also get the movement of the bag. And like if the bag moves too fast, it's very obvious. No object moves that fast. Uh, and noticing that immediately makes you realize that Catwoman is not that fast of a burglar. The film just makes her look fast. And there are a lot of other problems with that film, but um, you know, not that I'll leave that discussion for another day. Uh, and finally, silent films are all in black and white because the invention of color came after the invention of sound. Now we did talk a little bit about black and white when we were discussing cinematography. Uh, but today, when you make a movie in black and white, it's a choice. Back in those days, in the old days, you had no choice. It had to be in black and white. So like when we were talking about black and white, we, we mentioned things like the use of shadow, the use of different levels of darkness for emphasis and to control like what the viewer is looking at or the mood of the situation, those kinds of things. In silent films, all of this still exists. But it's not as intentional. It's not as skillful. Because even filmmakers who didn't really know how to use the nuances of black and white still had to shoot in black and white. So a lot of films, they didn't really pay much attention to the light and darkness and the quality of the image. It was to them. It was just a way to tell the story. Um, so when you watch an older film, sometimes you may feel like I really wish this was in color. And that is because the filmmakers have not paid attention to the use of black and white. But then like some films, uh, some people have gone back and taken an older film and added color to that film. But because this is after the fact, it's not an organic part of the filmmaking process. Usually it just looks kind of fake. It looks like it was something done in a museum or something. Um, so like films that were made back in those days, they have a historical quality that itself is worth preserving and paying attention to. Earlier film stock was highly flammable. In fact, it was much more easy to burn older film than film today. And so we have lost the vast majority of older films. The further back in the history of cinema we go, the more that we have lost. The movies, we usually say that the movies were born around 1895. Yes, 
the movies were invented in the 19th century. Uh, but from the late 19th century, early 20th century, so many movies were lost. Uh, they were put in warehouses and forgotten, and then the warehouses burned up. Or they were not put in climate controlled rooms, and so they were overheated and started melting or like rats got to them and ate through them. And we have lost many films. In fact, the number of films we have lost is kind of mind boggling. It's hard to imagine, but in the early days of film, especially after film became popular and became like the main kind of entertainment for society, studios were releasing dozens of films each week. Each week, each studio. So if you had like five or six studios, each week you had a hundred new films. So like, it's unimaginable the number of films that we have lost. You can go online and look at a list of silent films that we have today, and it will, you'll realize that we only have like 20 or even just 10% of the films that were made back then. And yes, most of those films were shit. Just like any other art form, most things are trash. But they are also valuable because film is not entirely invented. You have to have actual people and actual things and actual places. So even fiction films are a record of history. How people behaved, how people walked, how people dressed, what places looked like, and for the early silent films, how people talked. So the loss of so many early films is not just traumatic for art, it's also traumatic for history. And every year, new older films are rediscovered, new silent films are rediscovered in a library archive, in a garage sale, uh, buried somewhere or mislabeled. Sometimes you go into a warehouse, you think it's one film, but it's actually another film. Uh, so silent films are still re relevant to our lives today. Things are still happening in the world of silent film, even though nobody makes silent films anymore. OK, do you have questions about silent films? OK, today we're going to be watching a movie called The Artist from 2011. It won the Best Picture Oscar the following year. The story is about a silent movie star facing the industry change to sound films. Now, it's made mostly as a silent film. There are one or two places where you have sound that goes along with the image. Uh, but most of the sound is just a score. And for as you know, for most silent films, you can change the score, you can change the composer, and you still have basically the same film. Uh, but because it was made in 2011, the score is considered part of the film. It's made as a love letter to silent cinema. What this means is that it is not exactly the same as they used to make silent films. It uses many of the same filmmaking strategies. It takes from many similar plot ideas as older silent films, but we are always, always watching it from the present day. We always are aware that these are recreations, that these are attempts to do what our ancestors have done before us. So it's not innovatively creative. It's not giving us something new. It's recreating something that 
we have mostly lost. And this applies to the image and the speed and the acting. It also applies to the limited use of sound. And it applies to the use of intertitles. If we think of intertitles as written words, then they can be considered. Well, I mean, film is considered part of literature, but intertitles can be considered the most literary part of film. And so when we make a silent film today, we're not just. Building on. Decades of innovation in filmmaking, we're also building on decades of innovation in literature. How to write intertitles and dialogue to interact with the wider story. So I just want you to remember that. This is a silent film told from the perspective of today when silent films are no longer being made. And people have mostly forgotten how to make them well. It is not trying to make a silent film like they did in the past. It's a love letter not and not entirely a recreation. Do you have questions about the film? OK, before I let you go, I do have an announcement to make. Next week, we are going to watch a movie chosen by your classmates. The movie that your classmates chose is from last year and it's called Clifford the Big Red Dog. Uh, it's based on a best selling series of children's books in the US. I have not seen the movie. Part of the fun is watching the movie for the first time with all of you. And so next week, please watch the movie first. And then I will lecture. The, because I will not have seen the movie first, the first part of my lecture will be a reaction and analysis of the film. Uh, and after that, you're welcome to share your own ideas. If you disagree with me, you're perfectly allowed to disagree. Or if you have other, if you want to mention other things that I did not mention or notice, you are also very welcome to do that. And then the second half of the lecture will be introducing the final exam. So next week, the lecture will begin at 2.40. 两点四十开始讲课. Before that, please watch the movie. Uh, now again, I will not have seen the movie before class, so I will not be able to find a piece of writing that is uh, talks about the movie very well. But I, you know, usually after watching a new movie, I like to go online, see what the critics have written or like what other researchers or reporters have written about the film. So after next week, after class next week, uh, I will go online and read. And if I find something that I think discusses the film very well, I will post the PDF onto Moodle for your reference. OK, questions about next week? No. OK, thank you. And then week 18, we're going to watch a movie for fun. Um, because week 18 will not be on your final exam. Uh, I think I, I may try to. Give the lecture in Chinese. This is a Yeah, OK, so that's it. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break and then you can start watching the artist. It's not entirely silent, so you still have to use the subtitles. OK, see you next week.
Bye-bye.